This is Duke University. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome on this beautiful, sunny day. Thanks for coming inside. I know you'd rather be outside, but that's the way it is. We thank you for, for, for making that choice. Um, I'm delighted that we have with us Hillary Pennington. Um, uh, Ford Foundation obviously is shrinking its staff because <laughs> it used to be there was a vice president for education and a vice president for this. Hillary is vice president of education, free expression, and creativity. So they've consolidated three positions into jobs. one. Uh, and, and, and saving money that they can use in grant making, obviously for the same purposes. <laughs> uh, before, b before going to the, to the Ford Foundation, Hillary was um, a, an independent, a consultant for a while, but before that, she was director of education, post-secondary success, and special initiatives at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Does this cycle a, a, a kind of a pattern? I specialize in long <laughs> titles. <laughs> right. All of them three tripartite. Right. <laughs> which, which, which That's says, a problem. Which, which says something interesting. <laughs> right. <laughs> in any event, she's also a graduate of the Yale School of Management and Yale College and has a graduate degree in social, social anthropology from Oxford and a master's of theological studies from the Episcopal Divinity School. Um, I first met Hillary when she was running, when she had founded and made a great success of a wonderful organization called Jobs for the Future. Back in the 90s, a long, yeah, long time ago. And she, you know, she looks as young now as she did then. Um, right? Everybody who knows her knows that that's true. I'm not just simply flattering her. In any event, welcome. It's a great Thank pleasure you. to have you here. And before we, before we actually uh, start, I'd like to go around the room. You know a number of the people here, but there's some you don't know. And we'll ask people to inter in introduce themselves with a sentence at most. Well, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Thank you for coming. It's now my honor and privilege to introduce Hillary Pennington. Well, I thank you very much. So it is really um, a thrill and an honor to be here. And I'm going to do some brief, you know, sort of introductory remarks. But what I hope we can really turn this into is a strategy session with so many people who are so much smarter than I am about, uh, about philanthropy and about what it means to, uh, to build fields. So I, I am confident that we will get into a lively, um, a lively discussion. Um, so Tony made me do it, this title for this talk, which is a great and provocative title. And when we were talking about what I wanted to talk about, it sounded great at the time. But as I began to get ready for coming here, I began to think, wait, what does that actually really mean? What, you know, can, is it possible to quote unquote engineer a field? You know, what, what, does, what is engineer and what is a field? Um, and I won't bore you with all of the um, uh, thought processes that I went through in, uh, in landing where I've landed, but I think I'm gonna choose to interpret the words engineer um, as uh, the word, to be the word build. Um, because I think you can't really engineer um, any field life and work is far too um, unpredictable that, uh, than that and foundations don't have and should not have that kind of power. Um, so I am, and I, but I, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to help build a field and in particular to build a field, um, the field of philanthropy. Uh, and I'm going to do that in a couple of ways. I'm going to start with something very particular, which is the experience that I am in now at the Ford Foundation, um, an institution known, I'm sure, to many of you through its very long uh, history, and tell you a little bit about where we are right now um, institutionally. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, what, the work that we're doing to start to try to reimagine what our grant making um, should look like in the field of philanthropy given how the world is changing, and I hope that will lead us into a lively kind of conversation. And I think in particular to think about what it means to build this field of philanthropy at this particular um, moment in time. You know, it is a time of incredible ferment and creativity, and I think for those of us in the room who've been e either um, seeking money from foundations or giving money um, from foundations, uh, more is changing now than I think has, has changed in certainly my, um, my career in this field. With, if you look at the advent of newly wealthy individuals who are choosing to give large amounts of money that will quickly dwarf the Ford Foundation's resources um, and to think about uh, giving that money while they're living. And the fact that they exist all over the world. There are, you know, there's a huge newly, new growth of philanthropists in China, 
on the African continent, Mr. Dangote, who um, supplies 95 percent of the, of the um, cement on the continent of Africa, gave a billion U.S. dollars to his foundation last year. Um, so there's that. There is also, though, all the technology is enabling for small giving to be aggregated and all of the kinds of crowdsourcing and Kickstarters. There's the evolving work of impact, uh, impact investing. So it's a time of great ferment, and that is, I think, exciting. Uh, but it's also a time where, if we are honest with ourselves, there are a number of what I would really call dysfunctions in philanthropy that are equally alive and well. And all the advent of cool, new, exciting things and people is not necessarily going to change those dysfunctions for the better, unless we think in a, in a, um, a careful way about what it means to quote unquote, build a field. So just to call out um, a few of those kinds of dysfunctions, to put them there at the beginning of the conversation. Philanthropy continues to have many, many players, now an increasing number of players, all attempting to advance social change in bite-sized pieces. Relatively small grants for relatively short periods of time and a persistent um, interest in foundations themselves in constantly um, uh, re-evaluating and changing their strategies. Um, so that creates an enormous amount of, of um, swirl in the fields that they fund. Uh, too little communication cooperation between foundations in general. Uh, too little investment in reflection and learning from what it is they, uh, they do. Too many positive feedback loops and not enough negative feedback loops, um, particularly when the power differentials are the greatest. Uh, and that further impedes learning, which further impedes improvement. And then I think a lot of um, operational realities in, in the myths we tell ourselves about what it takes to build a durable um, nonprofit institution that is capable of producing sustainable results over time that create a very um, skewed kind of dependence on, um, on the sources of funding. So we're, we're trapped in these kinds of bu bubbles and dysfunctions, and <coughs> there's not a great deal of pressure or incentive to try to change them, despite the influx of new money uh, and new ideas. And then the last thing that I would put out um, just for context setting is that all of this is evolving, I think, at a moment where um, anyone who cares about uh, the world that we live in would know that we are facing really, you know, in a sense, existential challenges. If you think of recent pictures of huge blocks of, you know, the, the Arctic ice caps fall, shearing off and falling into the ocean, if you look at um, all of our world's persistent inability to deal with um, issues of race and ethnic tension, whether they're suddenly, not suddenly, but playing out, you know, in a Ferguson, in an ISIS, uh, it's, it would be hard to say that we are making um, adequate progress fast enough <laughs> against the big challenges of our time. So I think that's, that's just an important backdrop as we think about what it means to build, um, to build a field of philanthropy. And um, so I know many of us are struggling with these kinds of questions, whether we work locally or we work nationally or we work as the Ford Foundation does globally. Uh, we are an institution that uh, does about 55% of our grant making here in the United States, but 45% of our grant uh, making is global. We have 10 regional offices around the world uh, that are staffed and led by people from the countries where those, uh, where those offices sit. And they range from China to Brazil to Nigeria to South Africa to Indonesia. Um, so a broad kind of uh, worldview um, comes inside of our doors. So I want to just, before I get into thinking about philanthropy, I want to um, situate the Ford Foundation, because it is a very particular kind of foundation at, in this moment of time of changing context. And of course, it is an iconic foundation. It's one of the oldest, largest foundations in the country. And, uh, and I would characterize it, if we were sort of thinking about the ways that different philanthropies get characterized today, I would characterize it more as a catalytic foundation than quote unquote a strategic foundation. So w when I was at the Gates Foundation, that is a foundation that very proudly thinks of itself as primarily a technical foundation, a strategic foundation that is looking for particular kind of interventions and leverage points that can, can, ca can create uh, large change in big systems. And Bill Gates will proudly um, talk about himself as a technocrat. The Ford Foundation, if you look through our long history, um, 
I would say we have really been associated with three big kinds of approaches to change. We have always been an institution that has been about what Darren Walker, our president, calls three eyes. Uh, funding, building ideas and institutions and individuals. And so that is what I mean when I say catalytic change. You know, big ideas like the idea of public television or Head Start or um, uh, the whole discipline of area studies in higher education, uh, kinds of ideas like that the foundation has been associated with over its long history. Uh, it has always been a, a foundation that has helped to create um, institutions. Um, early grants to Human Rights Watch would be an example. Uh, it's funding to create um, MDRC, the manpower, uh, which does a lot of work to use social science research to help understand better the effectiveness of interventions. Played a big role in self-help uh, in um, an early stage. So it has always been a, uh, a foundation that has believed that institutions matter to creating social change and institutions that are independent of the foundation, that are not part of a foundation's intervention or strategies, but institutions that ex should exist out in the world and do, uh, and do their work in the world. And then it has been, uh, it is a foundation that has always invested in individuals. And um, from the idea, I think really believing in the idea that individual people can have ideas that change the world. We were early funders of Saul Alinsky, of Gloria Steinem when she came and said, no one believes me. And she was a lot more credible when she had a million dollars from the Ford Foundation and she was trying to do the things she did uh, early in her career with Ms. and the women's movement, uh, uh, Mohammed Yunus. So, many, many investments in individuals that are hard to characterize by the kinds of metrics that are dominant in how we think about philanthropic return today. And also a lot of investments in groups of individuals through fellowship programs. Um, we have funded the National Academy of Sciences for 50 years to help um, support the graduate education of, uh, of graduate students of color. We have um, supported over 5,000 uh, graduate students um, over you know over a 50-year period, and we continue to do that today. So those are those are unusual kinds of investments that make Ford um, an unusual foundation. And at our best, I think we we have a great deal to be proud of. But we are also just as easily um, held up as kind of a um, a litmus test for many of the kinds of things that are problems with foundations: too large, too bureaucratic, too diffuse in impact, spending too little money across too many different kinds of things. Um, and, you know, to be honest, when I sat at the Gates Foundation, we, the Ford Foundation was an example of what we didn't want to be. So, uh, and in, I don't know how many of you read um, David Callanan's blog, Inside Philanthropy, but he did a wonderful uh, recent blog called Philanth Philanthrosaurus the other day, which was uh, featured prominently the Ford Foundation's building at the center of the page about what might become um, uh, extinct and obsolete. In, uh, in how philanthropies um, work, and he compared the, lar the relatively large number of people who work at a place like the Ford Foundation in order to get out a certain amount of money with the relatively few, two program officers uh, in some of the new, um, newly created foundations. So uh, we are at a fascinating time in the foundation because we have new leadership, and we are asking ourselves a lot of questions about, um, about the Ford Foundation in this period of time. Should it change? Uh, how should it change, and can it, can it change? Can a big institution like that um, actually change course? And uh, our feeling is, yes, it should change. It absolutely has to change. And um, in large part, we need to change how we do what we do because the world that we live in is changing so much. Uh, because we are a foundation that has focused on social justice issues, so issues of inclusion and justice, um, there are many, th the, the ways in which those manifest themselves in the world today are changing um, rapidly. And if you look at the seeming sort of paradox of growth in democracies, but at the same time, um, democratic forms of government not being able to produce broadly uh, inclusive growth and, and shared wealth, the incredible rise of, uh, of income and wealth inequality, not just in this country, but around the world. When we think of ourselves, when we first started, we were really um, very focused on exporting U.S. ideas and ideals of democracy to other parts of the world. And today, the United States does not have the moral or um, geopolitical kind of um, unique 
uh, role that it played in the world in that period of time. And we experience this even with our regional offices, where um, being an American foundation in an Egypt, in a Nigeria, uh, in a China, in an India, is not necessarily um, something that is welcomed or revered. Uh, in fact, is often held up as um, something threatening, uh, an imposition of Western ideas and Western ideals that is inappropriate. So lots of reasons that we need to um, think about uh, what we do and how we do it. And so we are also asking ourselves a lot of questions about how we know that we need to change, um, but how should we change? And uh, I'll spare you all of uh, the ways that we um, are reflecting, but I just want to share a couple, again, as, as kind of uh, context setting. So one way in which large foundations that put out large, we, we are now um, paying out somewhere between five, 400 and 500 million dollars a year. Not uh, very small compared to the Gates Foundation, but still a relatively large foundation. At a much earlier period in our history, 40 or 50 years ago, there were about 600 people um, working for the Ford Foundation paying out that much money. And today there are 300 and declining. Uh, and our program officers um, do much, much more than get money out the door. Um, they are uh, uh, network builders, um, and they are, um, we tend to hire them out of the fields that we are working in. They tend to go back to the fields from which they come. And so they, a lot of their uh, path to impact is in the relationships that they build with, uh, with grantees out in the field. Inside the foundation, we, um, like any organization that has to choose to organize itself in some way, have actually become very, very siloed. And there are the three program divisions of Ford um, really almost operate as three separate foundations. And one, the one I lead having to do with education and culture, another division on democracy, rights, and justice, and a third on sort of markets and economic opportunity. Savvy grantees that see the world as an integrated set of problems. Let's say they work on um, women and girls, and they know that girls need both education and rights <laughs> and jobs, um, can be smart enough to come and sort of shop every floor in the foundation. Uh, we sometimes call ourselves the supermarket of social justice. But we don't make it easy for them to work in the integrated way that problems appear to them. And nor do we, nor do we capture what it is we know about the world. Um, so we are working um, to uh, change the foundation, how it organizes itself to, into broader kind of interdisciplinary themes. Um, they will be staffed by people drawn from the three divisions, the three points of view. We will be moving away from sort of an individual program officer writing their individual program officer memo and more towards uh, teams that share a diagnosis about a broad thematic area and then begin to program within that, but in a much more, um, we hope, integrated, uh, integrated kind of way. Um, and we have been asking ourselves a lot of questions about what it means to be, quote unquote, a social justice foundation, um, which by and large means we, would, we focus on, um, on the root causes that cause the kind of inequalities um, and, and systemic kinds of exclusion that show up in the world. Uh, and we have been in a fascinating um, conversation over the course of this year, really using and adapting um, some of the amazing work of Danella Meadows and how she thinks about systems change. So she has a very complex way that she talks about how you change systems. And we've, for our purposes, sort of um, aggregated into sort of four uh, kinds of approaches, um, changing the rules of a system, changing the rules. Uh, changing um, the goals that a system sets for itself and how it functions, changing power dynamics, and then most powerful of all, changing beliefs and attitudes. And we have been really applying that across all of the work we do with our board, with our staff, um, with our leadership team, and it has become a very powerful way to create a more common kind of conversation about what it is, in a sense, our theory of change, what it, what it is we believe um, is possible to change and why. And I am very optimistic that the Ford Foundation quote unquote can change um, because of the uh, really extraordinary um, shared belief that it has to among our trustees, our leadership team, and, um, and our staff. And uh, we, have, we are just coming off of um, tomorrow afternoon, a very, very intensive period where we've asked each of the 
regional offices around the world to um, spend a five-week period uh, looking at how inequality, which is the big challenge our board has tasked us to focus on in a much more singular way, looking at how inequality manifests itself in their context, what the manifestations are, what they think the drivers of that are, and therefore what they think that suggests for how we should configure our broad themes. And it's been just extraordinary to watch um, the kinds of dialogue happening, the kinds of analysis happening, and it's all, they're, they're all going to push send to us um, <laughs> Thursday night, and we'll be in a conversation with our board about that, um, about that next week. Uh, but we know that in order to, that we have to do less in order to do more. And so part of the reason why we are in this elaborate process is to try to figure out the most powerful kind of intersection points that we feel will help us um, disrupt broad root causes of inequality. So I say that just as a, as a quick backdrop so you have a sense of, of where the institution is in its long um, path and its long history. And I don't, um, I'm going to shift from that to our work in philanthropy, but um, how do you usually do the question? Uh, we do the, at the end, at the uh, end. usually, but uh, you can do it any way you want to do it. Okay, so I'll go another maybe 10, 15 minutes yes, and then. Yes, that'd be fine. Um, so uh, in the context of all of this, um, I have been charged as one of the things in the um, area of work that I lead to rethink the work that we do in, in our grant making and philanthropy. And for those of you who know, uh, who know Ford's history, this is again a very proud history. We have funded um, sort of building the philanthropic sector um, from 1956 grants starting through 2011, uh, about $500 million, um, over 2,000 grants. And we have focused, at, and um, during the period of our last president, we shut it all down. So we've, uh, we had this remarkable period of time where there was a sort of small, steady state of investments um, helping grow um, philanthropic intermediaries, establish an infrastructure like the Council on Foundation, so the independent sector, a lot of the academic research sectors on philanthropy. Including our center here. Including your center here. And then uh, starting in about um, 1994 uh, through 2004, a huge, huge spike where we did some very, very um, ambitious investments. And they focused uh, primarily on three, uh, sort of three areas. The first was encouraging philanthropy to support civil society globally. Um, so really very strong belief that the, that the, um, the health of civil society and, and philanthropy need to go hand in hand. Um, the second, a lot of investments in improving the effectiveness of philanthropy. For those of you who know the period of time when we had internal to the foundation grant craft, uh, which now um, sits at the foundation center. A lot of very intensive work just trying to figure out how to do the doing of philanthropy better, and in particular how to help program officers um, work well with grantees. And then um, a lot of investments in creating and strengthening um, intermediaries, infrastructure groups, affinity groups, uh, research institutions, and community foundations. A very strong um, bias towards um, building institutions with the word community. Including uh, the, the in their name. here, Triangle Community including Foundation. Including Triangle Community Foundation here. So by the Ford Foundation. Significant, significant investments over a period of time. And uh, all of that came to a stop uh, in 2011, 20, 2012. Sort of. <laughs> but in a foundation like the Ford Foundation, it's hard for things to ever come to a stop. So there's a, when I come in the door, and this is where you are now going to become my consultants and my focus group, uh, there is still a tale of grants out there in the world, even though the official program has been quote unquote shut down, and foundations being what foundations are, varying belief about whether or not the foundation really has stopped its grant making um, in philanthropy. And then, uh, the Ford Foundation being the Ford Foundation, there are also probably at least 20 living people who were program officers for programming our philanthropy, who um, continue to uh, think about the foundation's uh, place in the world, and many of them have moved on to um, different kinds of roles in philanthropy, including a Brad Smith at the Foundation Center and many, many, many others. Uh, so what Darren did, was to say he was going to open the door a tiny crack. We are going to restart our grant making in the United States only. 
uh, and we'll have a very small grant making budget, somewhere between um, 10 and 12 million dollars a year. And we need to figure out how we're going to really aim that, uh, aim that money, um, given the vast set of changes that I have just been um, describing to you all. And so um, we are about to hire, to, we just made an offer to a program officer in philanthropy. And over the course of the past year, we've really been building a kind of framework for how do we think about reconciling what we do and how we start again. And we quickly decided that um, our impact will not just be that 10 to 12 million dollars a year, that there's really sort of three intersecting um, circles uh, of our work. One will be the grant dollars itself. The second will be the ways in which we work with our regional offices around the world who are themselves um, turned to as a resource for the growing philanthropic sector in the countries uh, where they live. And the third will be how we do our own, um, our own grant making. And we, uh, we then have set ourselves a goal for trying to um, figure out how to attract more resources, better deployed, for quote unquote social justice um, kinds of causes, which is really swimming upstream in um, the dominant um, uh, mode of philanthropy today, which is very much oriented towards strategic interventions, towards spending down um, in your lifetime. There are very few philanthropists coming on the scene who would say, I think I should create an independent foundation with an independent board of directors and staff that should exist in perpetuity. So um, part of what we are doing is figuring out how do we actually um, work with and learn with new philanthropists as they come into the field as they are learning. Um, and how do, we, uh, how do we expand the ways in which they see what's possible to do in their work um, without uh, being an ideological scold. You have to eat your spinach and work on social justice or you are not um, you know, an effective philanthropist. So that's, that's, a, that's a complicated thing. And it comes back to some of the kinds of dysfunctions that I talked about before, of the ways in which foundations don't work well together. So we have been very, very deliberately um, mm -hmm. starting to do uh, co-created kinds of initiatives with other um, philanthropies. We've partnered a lot uh, with your former foundation um, and with others. But we are looking more broadly afield. And we'll be announcing some partnerships um, soon with some very um, unexpected kind of partners where we can find common ground. Uh, and we are um, thinking about how we can put in place a mechanism particularly for US-based foundations who are going to be funding in the Global South to help um, lift up uh, Global South organizations and voices that they would not otherwise see. Uh, so what we know from um, what I experienced uh, at the Gates Foundation is that for, for people like a Bill and Melinda who are starting to work on um, issues that show up in places far away from them, they, uh, the organizations that staff them do a relatively good job of helping them meet with farmers or with sex workers or with you know, people who are um, experiencing the kinds of problems those foundations set about solving. But what's very hard for them to see are all the kinds of activists and intermediary organizations and research organizations that are very, very small, uh, often and very young, in many of uh, in many global south organizations, but are led by amazing people, who have organizations that can ha can't. Um, if you come back to the idea of helping to fund institutions um, that need to grow and can grow and should be part of uh, problem solving infrastructure um, in their in their countries. So we're trying to figure out how we can, um, we can link more closely uh, with them. And um, the third thing that we have done is to really begin to try to partner with other funders around this question of feedback loops. And we have formed um, a partnership called the Fund for Shared Insight with a group of foundations here in the US, um, Hewlett uh, and Packard and uh, LiquidNet and PickHour. Uh, and the Rita Allen Foundation uh, and Kellogg to pool funds and to try to uh, invite proposals that would create stronger <laughs> feedback loops, not just from grantees to foundations, which we have a relatively stronger, um, but not strong enough, 
set of systems for, but, but really better feedback loops from the people that are served by the grants themselves. And we will be, um, we've just done a first year uh, request for proposals to get um, uh, proposals from the field about how to set about building those kinds of feedback loops. And um, we will continue to kind of deepen that work as we go along. So partly thinking about how to partner with and, uh, and educate newly wealthy people as they come into the space and to change the value proposition for what they think is important to do together in ways that recognize we will have different approaches and different um, strategies. Partly a set of strategies that are trying to lift up um, the institutional infrastructure that is important for fields and partly uh, an attempt to begin to fund tools and research that will help create uh, stronger kinds of feedback loops. One particular area of research we are interested in because we have a strong philosophy inside the foundation that we will fund uh, people and causes closest to the ground is whether or not foundation f philanthropy that works in that way is actually more effective. Um, is it more effective to put money out to uh, groups of citizens who decide how to spend it? Is it more effective to fund institutions like community foundations that are closer, uh, that are closer to the ground? And what do we know about um, what makes that work well and when it doesn't work well? Um, so I think I will, uh, we, are, we don't have a big strategy to lay out, as is obvious from my, uh, uh, my comments, but we have um, a set of things that we are, we are going to be growing over these next years, a couple of years. And um, we are trying as hard as we can to create it as a learning strategy. That means we will uh, have a set of hypotheses that we test, and then we will um, learn and adapt as we go. But our sense is that a lot of the quote-unquote philanthropic infrastructure that exists today um, is not that functional either. Um, when we first began our grant making many, many years ago, there was almost no infrastructure. There wasn't strong research. There weren't strong advocacy um, and policy institutions. There weren't strong technical assistance providers. Today, it's really the opposite. There's an enormous um, uh, plethora of institutions like that. And very, very few of them have viable business models that mean that they can perpetuate themselves without significant philanthropic dollars. Uh, but there's not, you know, <laughs> there's not uh, many, found not, not many foundations, only about 17 foundations fund in philanthropic wow. infrastructure. So there's an enormous challenge of what, what do you do um, about that? How do you think about what the infrastructure for the, um, the present needs to be? And how do you think about um, the business models that will sustain those. And how do you help those kinds of organizations understand how to work um, differently and better with each other? Uh, so I think I'll stop there um, and uh, open it up to questions and um, get more concrete about some of the things we're doing as, we, as I see where people's questions and interests right. take us. Absolutely fascinating, really interesting.